So, First John, uh, about faith and works. We're talking about that because we need both. And, uh, you know, this is not, as so many lessons, aimed at those that are outside the church. Um, you know, so many religions really are, um, well, we say Calvinist, and, uh, and I say it too, it's a nice accommodative term, and it is the majority religion in the United States. But um, actually, Calvin is nothing new. Job's friends espouse the exact same thing when you look at them, that you know, man is born for trouble, um, can flesh please God, they would say, he who is made of clay, things of this nature. They're, they're all, it's old, very old, this idea that humankind cannot please God, that flesh is incapable of doing what God wants it to do and making him happy. Um, but that's false, and that's always been false. Uh, God told the first generation from Adam, he told um, uh, Cain, sin's desire is for you, but you must master it. He didn't tell him, well, you can't help it, Cain, or, <laughs> you know, well, you're born after the fall, so you have a corrupted nature. No, none of that. He said, if you do well, won't you be lifted up? Sin's desire is for you, but you must master it. That's Genesis 4, the first generation from Adam. If anybody was going to be born with some kind of taint or stain from the original sin, purportedly, then wouldn't it have been them? And yet, the Lord did not say that. He said, if you do well, won't you be lifted up? You must master sin, not the other way around. So, there's nothing biblical about this idea, and yet it is the majority religion of the United States, as we say. It comes from a rich heritage of Puritanism inherited from England, and for the many things that they got right, such as freedom of speech and freedom of religion, uh, which we benefit from greatly in this nation, uh, they were completely wrong about the teaching of God, and they had nothing to do with the scriptures. Um, they weren't Christians. Uh, they never were. What you read in the Bible is an entirely different set of things, and I think it's important to look at this. Now, I, I realize that most people think that they are Christians, but you have to go back to what Jesus said. Not everyone who calls me Lord, Lord, enters the kingdom of heaven, Matthew said in the court, but he who does the will of the Father in heaven. Now, when it comes to 1 John, I, I like to take this as its own lesson because it is a letter written specifically with this idea in mind. There were already, at the time of the apostles, just like Job's friends and just like you know years prior, there were already in the New Testament, while John was still alive and preaching, people teaching that you could serve God with the mind but not with the body. Or that there was some way you could live wrong and die right. There's another way of thinking about it. That was very common even then. And it's always been a very popular doctrine. Um, you know, it's the artificial sweetener of the religious world. <laughs> you get all the sweetness and none of the calories, right? You, you, can, you can have heaven. You can have forgiveness. You don't have to have any guilt. And you don't have to do anything either. Such a deal. Yeah, right. But what you actually read of 1 John is chapter uh, chapter 1, verse 1, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, we apostles, that is, which we looked upon and have touched with our hands. And they, they laid eyes on this one which we have looked upon, which we have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. So John begins by saying, he knew this Jesus personally. This Jesus was from the beginning, and that's recorded in John's Gospel in chapter 1. But the point of what he's getting at here, what he's getting at, the point he's trying to make is, <laughs> he's one of the witnesses. He heard this. He saw this. He touched Jesus. Um, he was there. He was with him. And he's talking about 
the word of life. The word being that incarnate word in John 1, that the word became flesh and pitched his tent among us, and we beheld his glory, glory as of the only begotten of the Father. So this Jesus is the one whom they heard with their own ears, they saw with their own eyes, they touched with their own hands. They know this. It is real. Why is he saying this? Well, it's because the primary point here, the single most important thing, is to show <laughs> Jesus had flesh just like you and I do. And he lived sinless. That's the whole point. He had flesh just like you and I do. He just made better choices than we do. That's it. That's the point that they're trying to make in this. And that's why it's so important for him to say what he does. This Jesus was no apparition. This Jesus was not cheating. <laughs> he did not have the teacher's edition with him, although he obviously, as God in the flesh, did, did know everything. But he was tempted like as we, yet without sin. He was tested in all points. You understand why John is saying this with time here. If you skip a little bit down to the sixth verse of John, 1 John 1, he says this thing. If we say that we have fellowship with him while we ourselves are walking in darkness, we lie and don't practice the truth. That's as plain as it can possibly be. We have nothing in common with him if we are walking in darkness. He doesn't walk in darkness. In him there is no darkness. We're lying or wrong about that, one way or the other, the same effect. And don't practice the truth. This is not a practice of the truth. This is the opposite of the truth. We can have nothing in common with him while we are walking in darkness ourselves. There is no serving God in the mind without serving God in the body. The body does what the mind tells it to do. Most of the time, until you get old. <laughs> or play video games. But either way, the point is the choices you make, the things that matter, right? The choices you make, the things you lay your hands to do, what you commit to or fail to commit to, what you accomplish these things are from the mind. You decided to do them. So there's no way to have something in common with him while walking in darkness. There's no way to serve God with the mind only and the flesh does something else entirely. That's not serving God. It's not possible. Now he goes on, again, down to chapter 2. Children, I write these things to you so that you may not sin. <laughs> now, if anyone does sin, we do have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. It's true. Christians do sometimes sin. And yet, we can be forgiven if we repent. And we have an advocate, Jesus. Now, the thing that is important here is the second chapter, verse 2. He is the satisfaction, the satisfactory sacrifice for our sins. Not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. This is also important. Uh, sorry. This is also important because he is intended to save the whole world. Nobody is excluded from the ability to be saved. Nobody is excluded from the intentions of God to save them. We are all intended to be saved. We, we have our lives organized, Acts, 6, or Acts 17 tells us, in such a way that we should seek the Lord, though he's not far from each one of us. So Jesus doesn't have any kind of limit on who he came to or what he came for. There's no limit to what he atones 
or uh, what kinds of sins he uh, can satisfy God about. It's not just for us, it's for all the world. And the third verse continues, by this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. This also is rather plain, I think. There's no way to have fellowship with him while walking in darkness. There's no way to say that you know him if you're not keeping his commandments. Indeed, whoever says, I know him, verse 4 continues, but does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. See the parallel to chapter 1? We lie and do not practice the truth. Here it is. If you say you know him, but you don't keep his commandments, you're a liar, and the truth is not in you. If you were wondering what it means to walk in the light versus walk in the darkness, this is what it means. What is it to say, um, well, we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness? No, that's a lie. That is not practicing the truth. In other words, 2-4, if you say, I know him, but don't keep his commandments, that is a liar, and the truth is not in him. What is it to walk in darkness? To fail to keep his commandments, that's all. You don't keep his commandments, you're walking in darkness. You don't know him. You say you do, but you don't. And I am reminded, which I will bring up again, I am reminded of the fella who taught a lesson about pornography. He was against it. That was, I think that was the only good thing in that lesson, uh, is that he was against it. Uh, or he seemed to be against it. He also seemed to know quite a bit about it, frankly, for somebody who's against it. But anyway, that's a different matter. This guy uh, spent the whole lesson talking about psychology and psychiatry. Not that there's necessarily anything wrong with those um, uh, practices or pursuits, but they're not the gospel, they're not the Bible. He spent the whole time talking about the production, um, well, yeah, the production and the proliferation and how um, the neurotransmitter dopamine is emitted and, uh, or why that is brought forth and how it is used to associate with things in the mind, blah, 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 blah. A bunch of things that I'm sure he knows nothing about, actually. But he nonetheless spent the whole time talking about this, and when he was done, there was a question and answer session, which was on tape, which I loved, because I have, I'm a fan of whoever it was, and I don't know who, that stood up and asked him, hey, did you know that the Bible condemns the sin of pornography? Why didn't you just use those verses? And I tell you what the man said, because it's very important. That evangelist, whose name you all know, said, well, it's not like they don't know that. That was his response. It's not like they don't know that. My response to that is, yes, it is, because he's doing it. It's like he don't know that. You cannot fail to keep the commandments of God and say that you know him. You don't. You can't say you have fellowship with God and walk in darkness. You lie. It is like they don't know that. Now, why did he do that? That's a different matter. Um, as an aside, I will tell you why he did that. It's fairly plain once you get a little bit more mature. But basically, because the church there was not willing to do what they were supposed to do. If you have a member among you who is engaging in the use of pornography and has studied the Bible and understands that this is a sin and persists in the sin, then you withdraw from them. That's what the Bible says. They didn't want to do that. So that's how you get this other job. And he was, you know, I'm sure he was rewarded handsomely for that, uh, you know, until he dies. But chapter 2, verse 4, whoever says, I know him, but doesn't keep his commandments, is a liar. The truth is not in him. You see, it's the same idea. They say, oh, it's not like you don't know that. Yes, it is like they don't know that because they're doing it. Well, what are we supposed to do? Well, if they won't stop, then you discipline them. That's what the Bible teaches. But whoever keeps his word, verse 5, in him truly the love of God is perfected. By this we may know that we are in him. Yes, if you keep that word, on the other hand, not as a liar, um, no failure to practice truth, rather the truth is in you. 
if you keep that word, and in you the love of God is perfected. That's completed, brought to completion, brought to fruition, to maturity. That's the idea, that if you are doing the will of God, then in you is that love perfect. By this we know we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. Now that's tough, isn't it? <laughs> Whoever says he abides in him means if you, if you live with him, if you stay within him, abide in him, comes from what uh, John recorded uh, as some of the last words of Jesus before the crucifixion, which is very often called the high priestly prayer for some reason. But... Uh, he speaks about abide in me and I will abide in you as I abide in my Father. Abide in me as I abide in my Father. It's the idea of stay in here. Stay within the confines of the teaching of the Lord. There's no need to leave the fold or to, to leave the reservation. You, you, the, everything that you need is provided for you by God. And this is where you should be and this is where you should stay. <coughs> among the people with the truth of God. This is the meaning. So if you say that you abide in him, you ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. And that is a tall order. It reminds me of the New Testament about as God has forgiven you in Christ Jesus, you forgive one another. That's pretty hard because I've been forgiven of everything. <laughs> and there's some things that I want to hold against you guys. So <laughs> that's hard. I want justice for everybody else. Mercy for me, of course. But justice for the rest of you. It reminds me of that. Uh, I think that's really a true, uh, it's, it's a true uh, illustration that the call to walk in the way that he walked is a tall one. And there's nothing in there. there it, it, that's a hard thing to do when you want to do this. There's nothing in this that would lead you to any idea that you could just live however you want. And it doesn't matter. There's nothing here that tells you you can, uh, you can commit whatever you'd like. No, that's not what it says. Not here, not there, not anywhere. Not in a box, not with a fox. So 2.10, whoever loves his brother abides in the light. We've seen darkness. Now we're seeing light. We've seen uh, lying, um, falsehood, and now we're seeing truth. Whoever... Verse 10 of chapter 2, loves his brother, abides in the light, and in him there is no cause for stumbling. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and doesn't know where he's going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. Well, if you're in the light, there's no cause for stumbling, meaning you don't trip over things, hopefully, well, as often anyway, you don't trip over things during the day. You're outdoors, there's bright sunlight. You're not tripping over rocks and logs and whatever is out there. If you're out there at night and you can't see what's in front of you, yes, that's when you trip. That's when you stumble. That's when you stub your toe. This is all he's saying. It's just an example, an illustration. Um, whoever abides in the light, in him is no cause of stumbling. But this passage defines what it means to hate your brother. Whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and doesn't know where he's going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. What does it mean to hate your brother? Well, it clearly it means you're a stumbling block. You're in the darkness. You're walking in darkness. You don't really know where you're going. And the darkness has made you blind. You don't see either. You don't see clearly what you're doing. None of these things excuses it. And I think that's the scary part. We have to stay awake. We have to stay aware that this could happen. That I could become engaged in something not realizing what's going on. Well, then you go down to the 15th verse of chapter 2. Don't love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world Desires of the flesh, desires of the eyes, pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires. But whoever does the will of God remains forever. This is fairly clear. In the world, there are only three things. 
the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, the pride of life. That is to say, Eve considered the fruit. She saw that it was good for food. It was, uh, it looked good, and it was desirable to make one wise. These are the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, the boastful pride of life. That's all that it is. Everything in the world, that's what it is. That, when we talk about sin in the world, is what we mean. The world versus the church. Everything in the world is made of those things. That's all that they are. They may seem to be various and sundry flavors, but no, this is really what it is. Loving that world is not loving the Father. And James said something very similar in chapter 4. When he said, adulteresses, um, don't you know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? You cannot be God's friend and the friend of sin at the same time. So John is saying, look, this is not new. <laughs> sin is not new. It has the same attributes, the same characteristics that it has from Genesis chapter 3. But, 18th verse is the important one now. Children, it is the last hour, and as you have heard that Antichrist is coming, so now many Antichrists have come. That's how we know it's the last hour. The Antichrist is coming, and I think there are many uh, horror movies based on the Antichrist. <laughs> as if it were some specific entity, some monster or great uh, power that is going to get you. That is not the case. Uh, I mean, there probably are monsters. There probably are great powers. <laughs> but no, Antichrist is uh, actually just Greek for the opposite of Christ or the opposite of the anointed. That's all that it means, actually. <laughs> it's the opposite of Jesus. Well, what is it? It's the spirit of Antichrist. That's why he said what he did. You've heard that Antichrist is coming. That means there's coming a time when the opposite of what the Lord teaches is going to be exalted and upheld. Well, the time is now, says John, in his own lifetime, first century. Already, there are many Antichrists that have come. There's already many teachings that are the opposite of what Jesus teaches in the New Testament times while the apostles were around. Now this is important for us as well because people sometimes think if only um, if only Paul could be here to settle this dispute. He is here to settle this dispute. Just open your Bible and read it. <laughs> Say, well, no, but I, you know, it would be great if he would show me. No, no, no. No, they have, the, they have the law and the prophets. Let them hear them. They won't hear that. They won't believe even if someone rises from the dead. That's not the issue. The issue is whether they respect the scriptures. Do they listen to the authority of the apostles? Because in the apostles' day, people didn't listen to them. It's no different. We think to ourselves, oh, this is very changed. You know, it used to be the case that the church was made of tens of thousands of people. And then, uh, you know, uh, Western civilization almost collapsed and the churches went very dormant for a long time. Get that stuff, man. That's got nothing to do with us. <laughs> the truth is, they were always relatively few in number. Now, in Jerusalem, you had a very large number who obeyed the gospel. True. But was it all Judea? Not even close. And who should have obeyed? Well, all of Judea. They were being prepped for it for millennia. And outside of that, the churches were not very large in number. They were rather small, as we can tell. But what we're finding here is, even in the days of the apostles, people didn't listen to them. And if you read what Paul says about how he was not accepted in, as a speaker, uh, his words were thought not to carry as much authority. I mean, it's all over the New Testament. You shouldn't think to yourself that things used to be different. They weren't. It's always been a few who actually listened to God and did what he said. It's always been a few who actually respected the authority of the apostles and the Holy Spirit. 
That is not different. And it's not new. It's like the Pharisees saying, oh, if we had been alive in the days of our fathers, we would not have joined them in killing the prophets. Well, claiming them as your fathers is a sin already. You're supposed to be children of God according to faith, not lineage. They just don't see it that way, that's all. So Antichrist is here. It's, it's available at all times. It just means the opposite of Christ. It's what Isaiah said, woe to those who call evil good and good evil. It's an attitude. It's not some individual. It's, it's the way that they approach this. And this is what John is talking about for the rest of his letter. What is it to be anti-Christ? What is it to be the opposite of Jesus? Well, we just started with a foundation of we laid hands on this. This man was real. And then we said, you can't claim to be like him if you don't act like he acted. And he didn't sin. You don't walk in sin. You don't walk in darkness and say that you have something in common there or say that you are in the light. You can't. That's how he started the letter. Now we look at what does it mean to be the opposite of Jesus? Well, it's chapter 3. And verse 3, he said, Everyone who hopes in the Lord purifies himself as the Lord is pure. If you hope in Jesus Christ, then you are purifying yourself to be as pure as he is. And the fifth verse reasons with this, you know, Jesus appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has seen him or known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous as Jesus is righteous. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil. For the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason that the Son of God appeared in the first place was to destroy those works of the devil. Right. He appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. Notice, it's not to take away sins in the sense that um, he takes over your debt, and he pays it off from there, and, and you are free and clear. It's, it's not like that. It's taking away sins in the sense that he teaches you how to live right, and you stop sinning. That's the idea. You repent. You make things right with him, and you live a different way from him now on, knowing his teaching. No one who abides in him keeps on sinning. That's the truth. Christians should not be sinning. That's how it should be. And you'll always have people rise and say, well, now that is just arrogant for you to say that. Well, you, first of all, you're talking to John. He wrote it, not me. <laughs> and John spoke by the Holy Spirit. So, you know, you're actually talking to God, and I think you should maybe watch your words a little bit more carefully when you talk to God like that. But, no, friend... He said, you are not supposed to practice sin. You don't have to sin. Um, now, are we saying you're going to succeed? No. <laughs> no one is going to achieve sinless perfection. That's just not going to happen. But you should try. You should get as close as you can. And we do have an advocate with the Father, and we do have mercy with, with the Father. And he can save us. He got us out of Egypt. He can get us to the promised land too. <coughs> but what this is telling us is it's rather simple. Little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous. Whoever practices sin is of the devil. And it's just that simple. <coughs> That's all there is to it, really. Tenth verse says, "By this it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother." It's just that simple. 
If you're not practicing righteousness, you're not of God. If you're not loving your brother, you're not of God. Why practicing righteousness and why loving your brother? Because practicing righteousness is love the Lord your God with all the heart, soul, and mind. And loving your brother is loving your neighbor as yourself. It's just the whole book of the law and the prophets, the two great commandments. That's all that that is. Not a big deal, right? The 18th verse says, Brethren, little children, let us not love in word or in talk. Let us love in truth and in deed. It's a clear reference to James, uh, chapters 1 and 2, as the other ones were. We don't just love in word or talk. We love in deed and truth. It's clear that Jesus was real flesh. It's clear that Jesus is really being opposed. It's clear that those who love him purify themselves as he is pure, and those who serve him do not continue in sin. That's where we are in this letter. The 22nd verse says, Beloved, if... Uh, if our heart doesn't condemn us. We have confidence before God and whatever we ask him, verse 22, because we keep his commandments and do what pleases him, we have, we receive it. Because we do his commandments, because we keep his commandments and we do what pleases him, this reassures our hearts, according to John. We live right and we receive our requests because we are doing what he wants. Remember James 4 said, you fight, um, and you murder and you steal. You don't get what you want because you ask amiss to spend on your pleasures. That's what he's talking about. It's a clear reference. So we reassure our hearts by doing what is right and pleasing him. We pray with confidence when we know that we're keeping his commands. It is supposed to be your practice that you keep his commands. And it's not that hard to understand what must be done. What does the Lord require of you, right? So many passages of Scripture that talk about this. Chapter 4 of 1 John. In verse 2, he said, By this you know the Spirit of God versus the Spirit of Antichrist. By this you know them. Every spirit that confesses Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. He said this after verse 1. Don't believe every spirit. Test the spirits to see whether they're from God. Yes, now people sometimes get mad about that, but it's what it says. Now, the point of, of his putting it to the test is that it's tested according to Scripture. People were not listening to John in his day, and people are not listening to the scriptures in our day. But you know the Spirit of God, verse 2, by the fact that it confesses Jesus having come in the flesh. <laughs> this is the critical point, as we said at the beginning of the lesson. He did come in the flesh. Why is that critical? It's critical because he lived perfectly. It means that you and I, who have the same flesh that he had, though he had the Holy Spirit of God, we have the same flesh. You and I are capable of obedience. That's what that means. We can make good choices. We can live right. We can please him. And indeed, we must. His coming in the flesh means that <laughs> flesh is not inherently sinful. Flesh is not broken, corrupt, incapable. Or if you think that flesh is inherently sinful, then explain how Jesus had flesh and yet no sin. Actually, don't. I know. They've already come up with things. <laughs> Immaculate conception, etc., etc., right? There's all kinds of loopholes that they come up with. But all of those things, really, they do violence to the argument of John. What John is saying is, if Jesus didn't have flesh, then he wasn't a mediator. If he didn't have flesh, then 
We are not accountable. That's what it means. If there's anything that, you know, that we're capable of, that Jesus was not capable of, if there's anything that he could do in the flesh that you and I cannot do in the flesh, then he was no mediator. He was not tested like as we, yet without sin. If he had some ability beyond ours, if he had something about his nature that meant he could do differently, no. And that's not the case. John makes very plain that's not the case. He had flesh. We laid hands on him. He bled. He died. All these things are very real. The point that John's making is that Jesus' humanity is the key. If he is in the flesh, if he is a whole, you know, human being, and if he is to be a mediator, he has to be like us. And anything that makes it such that we can't obey by reason of our nature necessarily means that there's something wrong with Jesus too, or that his nature wasn't like ours. That's what John is saying. And those are both false. Those are both of them false. No, his nature was like ours. And no, there's not something inherently wrong with your nature. Children are born innocent. It is, you know, I understand it is a grand Puritan tradition to be your children for your faults. <laughs> and theirs sometimes, but no, it's really mostly yours. <laughs> you don't want people to think that you don't care. Or you don't like the impression that it leaves with others who might think you're not a good parent, right? That's what's usually happening. Let's just be honest. That's very puritanical. It's actually very communist, if you think about it. This whole ratting each other out. <laughs> He's less devoted than I am, I know. Because I saw his eyes were open during the Lord's Supper. Well, how did you see that with your eyes closed? <laughs> um, no, the truth is, you can't, you know, uh, you can't take anything that takes away from the, the nature of the Lord as a person like you and me. <laughs> That's what it means to say he came in the flesh. And that is the difference between us and, um, you know, the false doctrines of once saved, always saved, or, of, you know, salvation by faith alone. Um, you know, all these kinds of teachings. They don't obey the gospel. And the reason why they don't is because they say, well, you're not capable of obedience. Well, that can't be true. Jesus obeyed. Wow, but he was the Son of God. Well, yeah, but he had flesh. He was tested just as you and I are. And if not, then he wasn't the mediator, and we're still in our sins. And we're without hope. Seventeenth verse, by this is love perfected with us, that we may have confidence for the day of judgment. Because as he is, so also are we in this world. Right. You live like him. Perfect love casts out fear. Love is perfected with us and we live like him. And it's like he said earlier about in the, you know whoever keeps his commandments, in him is the love of God truly perfected. I understand that people grab that, you know, uh, perfect love casts out fear. If you're afraid, then you're not perfect in the love of God. And, you know, let us give you some more uh, milk toast here to soften things up. No, 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 that's not how you deal with fear. You deal, you know, fear of God is underrated and uh, not as common as it should be. You should be afraid of God. But the thing that you do about that fear, you know, there's worldly uh, sorrow and there's godly sorrow. Worldly sorrow is to hide, to go away, to pretend that that's not real or that you're not accountable to it. That's where false religions come from, right? But the, the godly sorrow is, well, I'm afraid of God with reason. How about we address those reasons? If I'm not living right, I need to live right. If I've made the bad choice, I need to make the right choice instead. Start living right from now on. That's how you deal with it. And when you do this, then you can perfect the love of God. Then you can have confidence for the day of judgment. 
And no, you're not going to achieve sinless perfection. We're not saying that. But you are going to achieve a different life, a noticeable life, a different person. All right. Chapter 5. In closing, uh, verse 2 tells you very plainly, by this we know we love the children of God when we love God and obey his commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. For everyone who's been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that's overcome the world, our faith. That's 1 John 5, verses 2, 3, and 4. We know that we love God, or we love the brethren when we love God and we obey his commandments. You got, you know, love the Lord your God and love your neighbor as yourself. It's all rolled up in one, and you do both. You do both. And that's how you are right with the Lord. This is the love of God that we keep his commandments. Yeah. It can't get any plainer. Do you love God? People say, well, I love God. I love God. But, right. Well, why don't you do what he says? Jesus said, why call me Lord, Lord, and don't do what I say? He's not much of a Lord if you don't do it. <laughs> His commandments, too, they're not burdensome. Everyone who's been born of God overcomes the world. Meaning everybody who's obeyed the gospel is overcoming the world by doing so. When you are uh, baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for forgiveness of sins, that's based on a repentance. You're becoming a new person. You're leaving the old ways and taking on the new thing. And this is how you become a child of God. This is how you are keeping his commandments. And it's not a burden beyond obeying the gospel, if you will. It's not some additional great task or, uh, you know, uh, the journey to the mountains to bring back some prize. No, it's it's the thing that you were called to do and staying faithful to it over the long haul. Did you notice that being born of God means overcoming the world? Did you notice that victory that has overcome the world is faith? So often people get to thinking that faith and works are opposite things or that they are somehow incompatible and that is not biblical. Everything John has said so far is about you know whether or not you really believe, you know whether or not you really love based on your actions, your works. Do you keep these commands? That is faith. If you believe God, then you obey God. You know, it's an interesting thing because uh, in Greek, the, uh, there's no concept of believing without obeying. It's just not in the language. They don't have a word for believe. Their word is persuaded. And when, they, when we would say, oh, I believe God, they say, I am persuaded by God. And it seems like a subtle difference. But the difference is, well, if you're persuaded by him, then you're doing what he says. He's your persuasion. That's their way of thinking. If you're not doing that, well, then that's not persuasive to you. That's their way of thinking. It's not even possible to believe without obedience. Like, what does that even mean? It doesn't mean anything. To the Greek mind, they were very concrete kind of people. Well, in the New Testament, John has made this very plain for everybody, no matter what language they speak. All of this that overcomes the world, all of this keeping of commandments, this is faith. And in the end, you have the 21st verse. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. This is not a random tag on to the letter. An idol, idol is something that can be seen. Idolatry is made of two words, eidos, which is like vidos or video. It's uh, something you see. And latria, like uh, the latrine, it is a place where you service a need. But it's service. It's the service or the worship of something that you can lay eyes on. That's what idolatry is. When he says, little children, keep yourselves from idols. He's saying to them, you know, this whole idea that you can uh, somehow obey God in the spirit or in the mind. 
while the flesh does otherwise, is actually nothing more than idolatry. You are serving something that you can see instead of serving the unseen God. That's what it comes down to. The bottom line of, of John, it's not uh, an afterthought or a, a random uh, you know, non sequitur here at the end of the letter. It is the summary of the letter. That, that's nothing but idolatry. That's just living life for life. Living for the here and the now, for what can be seen and held and touched, right? And yet John saw and held and touched the word of life. And that's the thing we ought to live for. That's what we ought to serve. So John's letter, very useful in this regard, I think. And we have to do our own introspection about this to see whether we are in God. Thank you for your kind attention. I realize it's hot in here, and actually our hosts realize that too, but nobody to date has successfully figured out how to change the temperature in this room. <laughs> um, the wiring was done a very long time ago. One of the uh, secretaries says that she thinks it's one of the ones in the, in, on the wall inside the office over there. Uh, she has as much chance of being right as anybody, but we haven't figured it out, so sorry about that. We'll do the best that we can. Thank you for your kind attention. And today, if you have not obeyed the gospel, we'll help you to obey the gospel, become a child of God, begin to live the life of God, to make the choices that ought to be made. If we can help you with our prayers as a Christian, we'll pray for you. If you are not a Christian and need to obey, we will help you find water to be buried in baptism for forgiveness of sins. If we can help in the Spirit, please let your need be known by coming to the front at this time while we stand and sing.